Come, Holy Spirit, speak to us today. Fill the hearts of the faithful. May we feel your presence, Lord, and may we know that where two or more are gathered, that you are there. And you are with us here today. Lord, for some of us, it's, it's been hard to see the miracles this week. But help us to see the miracles. And help us to be grateful. And help us to learn and, and help us to turn over our burdens and give them to you, Lord. And that you desire to take them. Lord, I also pray now for my words and the words that I speak and that they would line up with your truth and your love and your grace. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Several years ago, um, I made a decision which was a very odd decision. Uh, I think it was about 12 years ago, I guess it was now. I decided that I was going to run a tri or not run, I was going to do a triathlon. Now, a triathlon, um, if you don't know, it's a three-sport uh, discipline, uh, and uh, the first one is swimming, and I could tread water, but I didn't really know how to swim. Like, I get from one end of the pool to the other, so that wouldn't make much sense, right? Then the second part is to ride a bike. Um, you know, I ride a bike on vacation, and that's about it. Uh, since I was a teenager, was the last time I probably rode a bike. And then the third thing was running, and one of the things I hate the most in the world is to run. <laughs> so it made total sense, right? Now, there's... There, primarily four types of triathlons you can run. You can run the sprint. The sprint is the shortest, hence the name. Uh, it's a uh, less than a half mile swim, uh, and you run a 5K, so 3.1 miles, and then you bike 12 miles. And then you have the Olympic uh, length uh, triathlon where you swim a mile or just under a mile. Uh, you bike about 24, 25 miles, and then you run a 10K, uh, about 6.2 miles. And then you have the Ironman, which is for the crazy people, amen? Uh, it's where you swim about two miles, two and a half miles, actually, I believe. Uh, you bike like something like 100 and some miles, 112 miles, and then you run a full marathon, uh, 26.2 miles. And so as I was thinking about this, I, I said, you know what? The sprint is for wimps, so I'm not going to do that. And the uh, Ironman is for the crazy people. Uh, and so I opted to do the Olympic because I thought if it's good enough for the Olympics, it's good enough for me. And, uh, and so I decided to do this not knowing how to swim very well, not biking since I, was, since I was a teenager and hating to run. But here's the amazing part. I did it. I finished it. And I actually did another one a few years later, the same distance. And the crazy thing is, it basically happened because I made a decision in my mind that I was going to do this. And I did it. That's the power of having your mind set on something. If you set your mind set on, to do something, often, what can you do? You can do it. That's right. And if there's, uh, uh, you know, by God's grace, I was able to do that and I made it. I had to have a plan. I had to... Uh, 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 stick to the plan. Uh, if I had just decided the day of the triathlon to do all those three things, I would not be here today. Amen. But I had a plan. I stuck to the plan and I was able to do it. What about you? What are there times in your lives where you've just made a decision that, you know what, you kind of changed your mindset from this to that. And because you just made this decision that you're going to change your mind, you were able to do something. I'm sure most of us in here probably have examples of how that's happened in our lives, how we live that out. A mindset is a set of perceptions and beliefs we hold about ourselves and the world and how things work. They inform us what we can and cannot do. And the crazy thing about mindsets is they are often within our control. Other people can inform them, uh, can inform them. our experiences uh, influence them, but at the end of the day, we are responsible for our own mindset. And so what mindsets do you carry? We're in the second week of a three-week series called Generous, and uh, it's all about generosity, uh, and, which I believe is one of the trademarks, uh, one of the, the evidences that, that somebody follows Jesus is they have a generous spirit, a generous heart. Uh, and last week we talked about uh, the meaning of being generous, and this week we're going to talk about the mindset of being generous. 
In today's scripture, uh, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and the church in Corinth is um, uh, it's having all types of, of, of issues. Uh, and so Paul is right in there, uh, and he's trying to help them to activate a new mindset about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He's trying to talk with them about what it looks like in the way that they live their lives. And the Corinthians, like all of us sitting here today, we have great potential. But these Corinthians needed some clear direction. They needed encouragement, but particularly in generosity. I wonder what mindset these Corinthians carried. My guess is they carried similar mindsets that some of us have today. And so what I want to do as we start off today, I'm going to talk about some false narratives when it comes to generosity. Uh, and these are some narratives that, uh, that maybe some of us in here believe, and I just want to talk about them. And so as I go through these narratives, maybe think about if this is something that you subscribe to or not. Here's the first one. Scarcity. Let's all say scarcity together. Scarcity, scarcity is this idea that there is just not enough. And because there's not enough, I have to hoard what I have. Because there might be a point where I need it, and if I, don't, if I don't have it, then I don't have it. And so we have this scarcity mindset, and we just want to keep it to ourselves. And scarcity is actually very much connected to the next one I'll talk about in a second as well. And so we just, we just have this idea that this is all that there is, that there's not more. My dad, um, who's also a pastor, told this story that I think kind of talks about a scarcity mindset. This guy uh, was in uh, Europe, and he wanted to get to America and to try to, uh, to meet up with the rest of his family. And so he saved his money up to buy this ticket that would get him on a boat uh, from, uh, from England to uh, the United States. And so he saved and saved and saved his uh, money. And as he was getting ready, to, and when he finally saved the money, he was getting ready to go, and he went to... Uh, the supermarket or whatever, and he bought a really big block of cheese. And this was what's going to be his meal for the entire trip. That way he would save money. So he went and he bought this big wheel of cheese, and he was on the cruise ship, or it wasn't a cruise ship, passenger ship, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, and he, there was all these people, and he saw them at the dining tables, eating these great meals, drinking these great drinks, just having a great time. And uh, every meal... Three meals a day. For 14 days, my man had cheese. I bet he never had cheese again after that, right? Around the 13th day of the cheese, he was starting to develop some relationships with some of the people that were around him. And they said, why do I never see you in the dining hall? That's what one of the people said to him. And he says, well, I don't have money for the dining hall. And so I only, I've been eating cheese the whole time. And the guy gave him a very puzzling look. And he says, didn't you know that when you bought the ticket that that paid for your food as well? The guy didn't know it. This man had the abundance of everything. But he lived in the scarcity mindset. And he missed out on all that he could have had. And I really think that's a great analogy sometimes for the Christian faith. Is that we settle, we, we think that there's just not enough but the life of following Jesus is a life of abundance. God wants to bless us. God wants to bless you. And sometimes we miss out on it because we have this scarcity mindset. There's just not enough. And then closely connected to scarcity is the, uh, what I would say, the false narrative of fear. What if? What if? And I struggle with this from time to time as well today as well. Uh, you know, and, and if we're giving money, we're losing money. In my head, I know that giving is good, but in my heart, sometimes I'm afraid. And the reason I'm afraid is because, you know what? I have two uh, college-age daughters. i got two more daughters that are going to go to college. Uh, you know, we have braces. Uh, we have weddings. Uh, we have all these things that we still got to pay for. And so how am I going to be able to give and be generous and at the same time have enough for what I need? And maybe you have some fear about giving. Fear you won't have enough. Fear you won't be able to help your kids, your grandchildren. 
Fear you won't be able to retire or pay off your debt. Fear you won't be able to pay your rent or pay your mortgage. And when fear is our mindset, it can paralyze us. It can keep us from flourishing. When we begin to lose sight of what's real. The Apostle Paul uh, writes in 1 Timothy, The Spirit of God did not give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but rather He's given us a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Fear sometimes cripples us and keeps us from doing what God is maybe inviting and wanting us to do. Fear makes us timid. Fear makes us worry so much about tomorrow. We forget that we are living today. Fear makes us live in a world of scarcity. Fear also brings out the worst of who we are. Remember back to the beginning of the pandemic, uh, however long ago that was, what we, we had a scarcity of toilet paper, right? And there were stories and videos of people uh, in grocery stores with toilet paper stored up to the top. And, you know, people would try to get it. And they were like, no, you can't have this toilet paper because we might run out. Did we run out? Did we run out? No, we didn't run out of toilet paper. We still have enough. The mindset was once that once we, we, we have this toilet paper, we just got to have it. We might run out. We got to have enough. There's a song that we've sang here previously called Fear is a Liar. And it's by a guy named Zach Williams. And part of the chorus goes like this. Fear is a liar. Fear will take your breath, stop you in your steps. Fear is a liar. Fear will rob your rest, steal your happiness, cast your fear in the fire. Because fear is a liar. Fear often is a liar. Now, we all know there's good fear, right? And there's bad fear. But fear often is a liar. And then here's the last uh, false um, narrative I want to talk about. The ownership principle. So think about the first words that kids learn, right? They learn mom, they learn dad, some variation of that, right? What's perhaps like the third or fourth or fifth word they learn? Ma everybody knew that. Nobody cared about the toilet paper, but everybody knew that word, right? Mine, that's right. Mine. We, we get this idea that, you know, the kid's playing with their own toy, and there's a toy over here, and another kid starts to play with that toy. What happens? Junior gets upset, right? Goes over, takes the kid, takes the, the ball from the, the other kid and says, mine. It's a good thing we mature when we get older, Right? We don't, do we? We often have this mindset that it's mine, that everything is mine. And, you know, um, I've shared this before, I believe, as well. But when I would go to, when I, when I was in church, when I was a little boy, and my dad would start talking about the importance of giving, the, what, the, the block I had was this, is that, you know what, this is the money that they worked hard for. They should be able to keep all of it and do whatever they want with all of it. They should be able to buy Atari games with it. Amen? But as I got older, my mind, set, my mind set started to shift and it started to change. But some of us still struggle with this idea that it is mine. That is not somebody else's. It is mine. So what I want to do now is that those are some of the negative narratives, false narratives that we have. I want to talk about how we can shift from that and we can begin to have a generous mindset. And so here's the first one. Shift from scarcity to abundance. Let's all say that together. Shift from scarcity to abundance. Uh, as Mary Catherine read from our scripture today, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says this. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. When we have a scarcity mindset, we sow sparingly because we feel we need it. We have that fear that we need it because if we don't have it, we might need it. And the same thing the scripture says is when we have a generosity mindset instead of scarcity, we think about abundance. And I really believe that one thing that so many of us followers of Jesus miss out on is this idea that Christ offers us an abundant life. 
John 10.10 10 says, For uh, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I've come to give life and to give it more abundantly. Christ offers each and every one of us an abundant life, and so many of us are missing that because we can't quite trust God in every dimension and every area of our lives. And what we find is that when we begin to trust God in a certain area, we begin to experience abundance in that area. Now, as we talked about last week, when we talk about money, we're not talking about that God's going to add zero to your bank account if you start giving to church. That's not how it works. But you have the generous, what, the, what you get back is the blessings of helping other people, of serving the poor, the joy of helping others. That abundance is the abundance that we're talking about here today. And when we have a generosity mindset and we give abundantly, we are blessed even more abundantly. The scripture continues in verse 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of your righteousness. And you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. All that kind of reiterates what he says at the beginning. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly and whoever reaps generously will reap generously. Gener generosity generously we shift from scarcity to abundance and it really can change our mindsets and help us to understand what it means to be generous the second shift is to move from ownership to stewardship Again, we are not the owners. I really believe that for many of us, we struggle with this. We are not the owners. We are simply the stewards of what God has entrusted to us. All good gifts come from above. And what we've been given, we've been given to not only to use for ourselves, because we should use it for ourselves, amen, but we've been, we're to use it to help other people. In the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, Abraham is, 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 is he's still Abram at the time, and God says to Abram, you will be blessed to be a blessing. The gifts that God has given you, the resources that God has given you, the talents that God has given you, they are to be used to be a blessing, not just for yourself, not just for your family, but for others as well. You've been blessed to be a blessing. This is, um, I, have, I need to do this again, I'll have to break this out, but um, several years ago, um, somebody was, uh, so some kids were sitting here in the front row, and um, I said, does anybody in the church have $100 I could have? And uh, this girl in the front row raised her hand, and she came up, and she gave me five $20 bills. And then she sat back down. And everybody was just going, oh, wow. And then I said, and then I turned to her and I said, why were you able to give me that money? And she said, well, you gave it to me before the service started. <laughs> if that had been her own money, probably that she'd worked for, she probably wouldn't have given it up so quickly, Amen. But once we come to understand the proper mindset that it's not ours, that it's truly God's, we begin to see ourselves as stewards, and it enables us to be generous. I understand we have hardworking people in here that spend a lot of their energy and a lot of their time working hard to be able to provide for their family, and, and that's a good thing. But we also need to rem be reminded about where we got that work ethic from, where we got our skills from, where we got our gifts from. And once we understand that those are God's gifts that have been given to us that we in turn use, that enables us to become generous. Psalm um, 24.1 says this, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. We are to manage what God has given us. The third way that uh, uh, we have a generous mindset is to become a co-conspirator with God. The word conspire literally means breathing with or to breathe together. 
And for most of us, we, we suspect conspiracy uh, brings up the ideas of wrongdoing, of secrets, and planning to do something illegal or harmful for another. That's not what I'm talking about, if you were wondering. There's another conspiracy going on. God's conspiracy. Whereas human conspiracies takes life, God's conspiracy gives life. Whereas human conspiracy destroys, God's conspiracy creates. Whereas human conspiracy hurts, God conspiracy heals. And so to be a co-conspirator with God means we are a blessing. And when you're generous to God, think about all the good, all the blessings that come from this church. Think about the fall retreat that we had last week and the, ch- and the young people that were blessed because we had that retreat and they were able to spend time growing on their faith. When you give to the church, you're co-conspiring with God for that to happen. Think about the people at the Belmont Food Pantry where we provide food and volunteer hours and, uh, and other things that we help. When we give, we are co-conspiring with God that we are able to feed the hungry. When we brought our coats in for the coat drive and when we get ready to do the Thanksgiving bags for Belmont in a few weeks, we are co-conspiring with God to be a blessing. When we do roof digging week and we go into these schools and we love on these teachers uh, and we let them know that we value them, that they're important, we are co-conspiring with God to be a blessing to them. Think about the children that are in Sunday school right now. When you give to the church, you're co-conspiring with God that we can teach them about Jesus. Isn't it cool to think that you are a co-conspirator with God? You are. And when we become generous, that's what we get to do. Shift from scarcity to abundance, shift from ownership to stewardship, and become a co-conspirator with God. Got a few next steps, and we're wrapping up here. Which false mindset, scarcity, fear, ownership, affects you the most? Which one do you struggle with the most? Which one, maybe it's all three, I don't know, but maybe which one is the most? Just, and maybe just have a discussion with somebody uh, in your family about this. But which one maybe prohibits you from being more generous? Is it scarcity? Is it fear? Is it ownership? And then the second next step's kind of the flip side of that. Which generosity, which generous mindset abundant stewardship or co-conspirator resonates with you the most? Which one of those says, oh, I like that. I've never thought of that before. Which one of those resonates with you? And which of them might enable you or help you to take that next step? And then the last one is this. I want to invite you to step into being generous. If you're a member of our church or a regular attender, This week, you should be getting a packet in the mail that's going to have a whole bunch of information. Uh, This is something we do yearly. It helps us to know how we can make plans for next year's, uh, our mission and our ministry, what we want to do as a church. And uh, and so I invite you to take a look at this book and to look at uh, your giving to our church and see what you might be able to do. And I want to show you a couple of quick slides. This is the first one. It's called Our Giving Path. And uh, you can see... um, And what I like about this is that it's a path. It's not a jump. And so if you're somebody that hasn't been able to give or chooses not to give, we're not asking you to give a million dollars next year, amen? But if you want to, (laughs) you can. But in all seriousness, if you've not been able to give or chosen not to give, just take a small step. Take a small step and maybe uh, become a first-time giver. And if you're somebody who this past year was your first time giving, then take the next step and maybe become an intentional giver where you, you make a decision, oh, this is how much I want to get and I'm going to start giving more regularly. Then after intentional giver, you have a growing giver, a growing giver where you maybe increase the, the amount that you're giving till you get to a tither. Tither is 10%. Uh, and then above that is an extravagant giver where people give uh, greater than 10%. So where are you on this giving path? 
and prayerfully consider taking a next step in your generosity. Here's the next uh, slide I want to show you. This is um, our step chart. Um, this, both of these charts will be in the book as well. And this breaks down our giving. And so we have $1 to $250. We have 106 households, family units uh, that give for the whole year between $100 and $250. Uh, and so find where you are on that step chart. And I want to invite you con to consider taking the next step on that chart. Now, our, um, if you do an average of our zip codes, the average income is somewhere around $110,000 for households in our area. Uh, now, there are obviously households that are higher than that. And there are obviously households that are lower than that. And so when you see, you know, when you look at the people that give above uh, $10,000 a year, you could make the argument that those are the people in the life of our church that are tithing. The truth is that might be accurate because you might have people that are on a fixed income that make significantly less and are tithing, but that number doesn't get that high. And then you might have people that are making a lot of money. They're given what might appear like a tithe, but it's actually a smaller percentage. But my hope is that you'll just take a look at this, figure out where you're at, and prayerfully consider taking your next step uh, in your generosity. We all have a lot of opportunity to think about our mindsets. And I just want to prayerfully ask, invite you to do that. If I can make a decision to run a triathlon, you can too, amen? But if I can do that, that's the power that our minds have, the power to be able to make these decisions and then to follow a plan to do it. I really believe Paul's words, the first verse that Mary Catherine read, is so important for us to remember. Whoever, he says this, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. I invite you to step out in faith and to sow generously. And I believe God will keep God's promises and will bless you and bless others through that generosity. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Most gracious and loving Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to worship today. And Lord, um, may we be reminded of your generosity to us how you have overwhelmingly and abundantly given to us your love, your mercy, and your forgiveness. And in the same way, Lord, help us to be generous to those around us through our love, our mercy, and our forgiveness as well. And if we need to change our mindset, Lord, help us to do that. And help us to step out in faith to do And now, Lord, let us continue in a time of prayer. And I invite Michael to come on out if he wants to, to, to play some music. And we're all invited to pray in our seats, to come up to the altars and pray, to light a candle, to fill out a prayer card, to take a prayer square. And let's pray about whatever burdens are on our heart, whatever worries and anxieties we have. And may we find comfort in knowing that God desires to hear our prayers. And not only does he desire to hear them, but he hears them. Let us continue and let us pray.